Welcome future lawyers to tonight's BarMax webinar. And hello, Emily. Hello, Celeste. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you too. Um, Emily, I'm Celeste Bowles. I'm the content director here at BarMax and Emily Morgan is one of our instructors. Mm -hmm. And we both love helping people pass the bar. Uh, but when we were talking about subjects to talk about, Emily, you thought of this one. I did. I did. Cause I lived this one. Yeah. And Emily, I think you're going to share more of your story, but there are a lot of reasons why people might be taking a bar exam many years after they have graduated from law school. And that includes having never passed the bar the first time or maybe they've been practicing in another jurisdiction and suddenly have to take another exam. That did happen to me. Um, or, um, you know, perhaps they've been doing something completely different and not thinking about the law at all. And that was you, Emily, was since me. graduation. <laughs> and so you need a way to pass the bar that's going to be streamlined and fit your current life. And, and, uh, most importantly, lead you to success. So that's why Emily and I are here. We want to help you pass the bar after the first time away, uh, after having time away from the law, um, whether you ever passed a bar exam or took a bar exam before. Um, so Emily is going to talk a little bit more about the mental game aspect of this, sure. about the challenges that you as a group face and the strengths that you bring to the table. Because in fact, having worked with BarMax students, many of my best, most fun, wonderful students to work with are older people who have been coming back to bar exam prep. Um, and, and you bring a lot of strengths to the table. And so we wanna identify those so that you can capitalize them, uh, capitalize on them. And then I'll be getting a little bit more into the nitty gritty, um, a little refresher or uh, new information for some of you on what's on the bar exam. A little bit has changed um, in recent years. So we'll catch you up on that. And we'll give you tips about how to prepare. So, um, but again, you've seen me throwing some of these testimonials up here. Um, these are people who were in your position and there are more on our website. I was looking, I found two different testimonials from mothers of four <laughs> who used bar to pass the bar. So um, this webinar is free. It's for everyone and we're gonna post it up on YouTube. So it's for everyone in the future, but we also want you confident that bar max will work for you. With that, Let's get to the first part of our agenda. And from here, I'm going to leave it to you, Emily. Let's see if we can get this going. Like Celeste was saying, I was very much in all of your shoes. Um, and I actually just passed the bar last year. So I was literally in your shoes last year. And um, my my situation was it was five years that I was um that I was away, if you will, from the law between law school and when I passed the bar for the first time. I think, yes, there are challenges that come with that, but like Celeste was saying, and like we're gonna talk about, there are a lot of strengths there too. For and and the big overarching one is just I feel like one of the hardest things when you're taking the bar exam is that it can be become this kind of all encompassing thing that swallows you. And when you're going into it straight after law school, I feel like it's so easy to get swallowed into that. There is nothing but this. This is all of your life. This is all of existence. And I do feel like when I came back to it five years afterwards, that it was like, okay, I have enough perspective to know there is life out there and I can engage with that real life. Right. Okay. So um, with, with that said, let's, let's jump into some of this. Um, some of the the challenges that I think that we can absolutely meet um, when returning to to pass the bar are, you know, we need to bring our accomplishments. And I don't literally just mean the stuff you put on the resume, but the skills you have gained, the maturity that you have developed, the responsibility, all of those sorts of things that you can bring to the table while 
updating your knowledge and skills because yes, updating your knowledge and skills is a thing that should happen, will happen, must happen. But nonetheless, um, it's not just a matter of, oh, I've got to get back to where I was before. No, you want to bring your actual accomplishments and and personal development into this as well. Um, I also think, you know, one of the biggest challenges in learning everything you need to know in order to be able to pass the bar, developing all the skills that you need to develop in order to pass the bar is time management, right? Because this is a huge amount of material that we are responsible for when we're engaging with this exam and managing your time in a way that you, you know, do everything with all the different content you need to do and also balance between all the skills, you know, am I doing enough over here? Am I doing enough over here? Time management is huge for anyone when they're studying for the bar exam. And I think that having you know, work experience, or in my case, it was family experience, um, whatever that is, can can really totally change the way you engage with time management. Um, for me, um, in, in my personal situation, you know, I became a parent um, in between those, those five years. I actually graduated from law school with my first baby on the way. And so I was going to become a lawyer and a mother in the exact same year. That was the plan. Um, and then there were medical complications that made me rethink all of that. And then it was five years before I came back to it. And in those five years, I went from thinking of things the way a student would to thinking of things the way a you know mother of two who is always pulled in mul multiple directions and has to balance all these different priorities would and the difference was astonishing and in a good way right so there may be challenges with time management in that you are pulled in those different directions but also you have learned how to manage being pulled in a bunch of different directions, which I think is great. And um, the other main challenge, I'm going to get into more details on these, but the other main challenge there is that, you know, you should trust yourself in order to overcome the test anxiety. And I mean two things by that. One, I mean, remember, again, that there is life beyond the bar exam and you're handling that. And the other thing that I mean by that is remember that you are the same student who graduated from law school. You haven't lost your ability to study. And um, that was that was really important. That was really important for me. Okay, so your accomplishments, and again, I don't just mean resume things, I mean anything and everything, supplement your knowledge. For me, I did have that, you know, when I first started engaging with the studying, I was just like, what am I doing? Like, I've been out of this mode for so long, but really I, it was like pe what people say about riding a bike where you, you never actually forget it because I had this like onboarding and then all of a sudden it was all there. Oh yes. I remember this, right? It wasn't, I was not starting fresh. It was not one L year. And it was not even just trying to go back to who I used to be. It was this new, more mature person who was still capable of studying the way that I used to. And um, that was a relief for me because I, I truly didn't know if that was going to be the case or not. Um, and yeah, and I, I was I was very happy and relieved to find that I hadn't I hadn't lost anything. It was all buried in there somewhere and I was able to refresh it and and pull it back out. And again, like I was saying, you know, the challenges that I faced and the perspective that I got from that, from encountering real life, actual situations, you know, it was very different than the person who I was when I was um, when I was a law student and sort of that limited perspective was all I had to bring to the bar exam. I mean, this is a very small example, but for one thing, I, I was a homeowner when I came back and um, when I was looking at real property, let me tell you, I looked at it with totally different eyes than when um, I was looking at this as a law student in my like, you know, law school apartment. It looked very different when I was encountering that area of the law. Um, and just that difference in perspective was huge with how I was able to engage with different pieces of the law. Another one is family law. It was very theoretical when I took that class in law school. And then when I actually had a family, when I was coming back to it five years later, all those relationships and the interplay that it was describing were made real because I had had a chance to actually engage with those in real life. Um, 
So that was, that was kind of neat to experience actually. Um, so one thing that some of you may be encountering is if you are actually trying to get licensed in a new jurisdiction. So what I'm thinking here is, you know, you actually took and passed the bar in the past, you practiced in a jurisdiction, you're trying to get licensed in a new jurisdiction. What may be concerning you about this is that you have to wrestle with some new rules. This might also be the case if you went to law school in one place, now life has happened, and you are taking the bar in a different jurisdiction that you don't feel like your law school necessarily prepared you for, right? And the thing here is you speak the language of the law. And what I mean by that is all of us were in there one L year trying to grapple with this as big picture concepts. We were trying to find a spot that we could like reach in and grab onto the law. That is not what you have to do now. Um, that, is, that is not what you're going to have to do. You already speak the language. This is just a matter of tweaking your knowledge, adjusting it and adding some things in on top. You're not starting from scratch. You're not starting over. And that, that learning curve that we all went through where you learn to speak this language, you've already done it um, and you don't have to do it again. Another thing that may have changed between when you were in law school and when you are going back to take the bar exam is if you're encountering new technology. And I know um, Celeste and I have um, talked with and spoken about students who they had much longer gaps than just five years and they were still able to be very successful using the Barmex program. But one thing that they may have found more challenging is just the idea that the technology has changed a lot. Um, the thing is, though, technology was new to everyone at one point. And I think that this is a this is a practice makes perfect thing. You can expose yourself to the general way that the technology operates before you get to the bar exam. The key is just to not be intimidated um, and then to get the exposure that you need. Just acknowledge that you need to set aside a little time for that and then, and then do it. Um, again, I think when we're talking about getting back to the study, the study mindset and the study mentality, which is huge, it's huge to, to try to get back to that. What I would suggest that you focus on is not trying to go back literally go back and think about things the way you used to, to think about things from the perspective of that student that you used to be, but rather try to bring who you are now to the test and engage with it that way. And I think that acknowledges your, your accomplishments, your personal development, any challenges that you've overcome, and acknowledges that those, those build you as a person and make you a more successful candidate. So you want to try to engage with the test as who you are now, and not just try to think about returning to who you were then. Um, on that note, time management. You can manage your time better than a student. This was, this was absolutely certainly true for me. Um, and the way I like to think about this is you may have added responsibilities, but you've added responsibility. In other words, there may be more on your plate, but you also know how to handle it. Um, a lot of people if they are returning, they're in the situation where they may have a full-time job, family responsibilities. It can also be different, the commitment of sitting for the bar exam, because you feel like you're doing something different than what everyone else, like your peers are doing, um, where in law school, you know, all your peers were studying too. And something I struggled with was the perception that that meant that I was, that I was missing out, right? Because um, if I was the only one studying, I felt like I was like giving up this time. And I felt this sense of like, well, I, I, I can't compromise these things. I have to, um, I have to go ahead and make time for everything that I would make time for if I was not studying for the bar exam. A huge part of why I think I was able to be successful um, on the bar exam was that I, I, I gave up on that perspective, essentially. I, um, I, had, I admitted that I needed extra childcare and I got that. I allowed friends and family to, you know, step up and help. And I also just admitted that I might actually miss out on some things. There might be some birthday parties or things like that, you know, gatherings that I was not able to make. 
And the reason I decided I was okay with that was because this was a priority for me. And it was a priority for me, not only because it was something that I wanted, but because I thought it was going to be beneficial to my family in the long run. And the studying for the bar exam is a short-term hurdle, not a way of life. And when I was able to get into that mentality that this is a couple of months, I can do this and then it can be behind me. It was hugely helpful to me, even though I didn't have that peer group all around me that was all doing the same thing at the same time that made it seem like the natural thing to do. I feel like this was this was absolutely worth it to me personally. Um, and I would encourage you to think about it that way too, to think, okay, you know, I'm making modifications to the way that I'm doing things, but this is not forever. This is to pass this test. This is not a way of life from here on out. I can do this and then I can move forward. And um, and that was that was big for me. In, in being able to, to make the changes and, and the sacrifices that I needed to make. Um, yes. So another, another, um, you know, thing we want to acknowledge and decide how to address is, is test anxiety. And I truly believe that the best way to address that is to trust yourself in order to overcome this. You know that you can handle not just the bar, but life beyond it. Right. I mean, I personally, as a law student, was not and and did not have, you know, the full-time job, the family life, the all the other balls that I was used to keeping in the air. And also, so you have that on the one hand, what you are doing, who you are as a mature, complete person outside of the bar exam. And then you also have the fact that you know you're a good student if you're sitting here and you are preparing to sit for the bar exam, you graduated from law school, right? So already we're talking about the academic skills, those basic academic skills that you may need to build on top of, but you have those basic elements. And so I think when you can put those two things together, when you can say, I do have the academic underlying skills, I just may need to sharpen or hone or refresh them, but I do have them. And when you compare that with the idea that I can actually handle not just the bar exam, but real life, life beyond the bar exam. Those together are the recipe to overcome test anxiety. Um, now, one of my particular concerns um, was the idea of testing my ability to test. And what I mean by that was I was concerned that after so long out of the academic mindset that like, can I actually sit down? memorize the information, turn around and spit it back out onto a test. So my state required an up-to-date um, MPRE, the Multi-State Professional Responsibility Exam, and I had been out too long, so mine had lapsed. Um, so I actually had to retake that. And that for me was hugely comforting because it gave me the chance to prove to myself, as it were, that I could sit down, I could study, um, I could take and I could pass the test. I think that whether you have an experience like that, whether you sit for the MPRE or not, it is huge to build the confidence to know that you can do the academic tasks before you get up to the day of the bar exam. So there is the studying and the learning but in order to overcome the test anxiety, there is also the piece of let's test it, let's prove it, let's show it to ourselves. And I think that can be important for everyone, actually, but particularly important when you're returning to the bar in order to make sure that, you know, that test anxiety is, is well under control. So now that we've sort of talked about some of the challenges and how, you know, we're uniquely positioned to address some of those challenges um, that affect everyone. I also want to hit some, some particular strategies that I would recommend. Um, so one big one, and one that I would recommend doing first thing, is your motivation to know your big why, as I would call it. You know, why do you want this? And, and I don't just mean, well, I went to law school. And so I want to pass the bar because it's the next natural step. You know, there are tons of paths out there in life, as most of you are learning, because you didn't follow the, the exact, 
exact path of law school straight to the bar exam, straight to practicing. You know, everybody has their own unique path. And so the question that I would ask, this is a big commitment. And so why does it make sense for you to do exactly this exactly now? And why is it worth it to you? Right. I would visualize that goal. That's what I did. I was like, okay, I know that I want this. I know I want this right now. You know, I got to the place where, where I thought that my kids were old enough that I could actually set aside that time and study. And I felt like I'd been waiting until we got to that point. And so when we got there, I was like, you know, yeah, I'm ready for this. Even if that means, you know, the next couple of months are a little crazy or a little difficult or a little more challenging. We're going to, we're going to do it because I, I want what's on the other side of this. And I think that that was big for me in going ahead and thinking through, is this worth it? Is it not worth it? Before I got way deep into my study plan, because when I was in the depths of that um, and and it wasn't particularly fun and I didn't particularly want to do it, um, having the goal set out ahead of time helped me to, to prioritize. When I was in that moment and there was something else I would rather be doing, chasing my kids around or whatever it is I wanted to do when I needed to be studying it, let me say, I've already, I've already chosen this priority and I, I'm going to stick with what I chose. So the other thing after deciding why you want this is I would, I would realistically assess what it is you need to succeed. Right. And um, the first thing is to set aside a, a, an amount of time that you can, you can actually do it. You can actually set this amount of time aside. It's not it's not a dream amount. It's something sustainable, um, but that you can stick with this consistently. And I would find those study blocks and protect them. Don't allow anything to infringe on those. Choose times when you can really actually focus. For me, this was this was only three hours a day. Um, those were the three hours a day when I had childcare, but I didn't have other responsibilities. That's what there was. There, there wasn't anything else. There were those three hours. And that's what I had. And I had to, I had to work with what I had. Um, and, and also basically no time on the weekends. I basically had three hours a day, five days a week. And then when it got very close to the bar exam, I was able to set aside some weekend time, but that was, that was what I was working with. That was my reality. So once I decided that that was the amount of study time that I had, I worked backwards from there. And I, I basically created my own calendar and I used, I was a BarMax student as well. And so I used the sort of the BarMax like sample calendar, but I basically looked at this and I was like, you know, in three hours a day, I can't follow the calendar as it is laid out. So I took the assignments and backed them up by several, several months and started early and was able that way to progress through the material um, by by backing it up and, and working on it that way. And so I would, I would recommend that as well. Once you decide what blocks of time that you actually have, then create a schedule. And again, you don't have to start from scratch. You can start from the calendar that already exists and then just use that and say, okay, but how much can I actually study and how do I need to spread this out and stuff for this to be achievable with my actual real life? And then the other thing I would recommend is look at each subject on the bar exam individually. And what I mean by that is like, did you take the class and do well on it in law school? Did you take the class and maybe not do so well on it in law school? Or did you not take the class at all? Right. Because if you took the class and you did well on it, it's just refreshing. If you took the class and you didn't do so well on it, then what you may need to shoot for is how to develop mastery of those issues before you get to the bar exam. On the other hand, if you haven't taken the class at all, and that's a, that subject matter is, is an unknown, then you need to block off enough time that if it proves to be a challenge, you have the time available, but hopefully and maybe you, know, you engage with that material and you're able to master it sooner. But I, I categorized all the subjects into sort of one of those three groups before I even begin studying so that I knew where I stood in regards to my knowledge and the material. So 
like we were saying before, yes, there's some challenges with this, but there's definitely, definitely some advantages. And one of the big ones there is timing. Because like I said, I looked at it and I backed it up and I started early. The ability to not have to, particularly if you're working with Barmax, cram all of your study time in between when law school graduation happens and that summer bar exam date is huge. It's massive. I mean, that was what made it possible for me to sit for the bar exam when I did, because it was just not realistic for me to be able to block off that entire time for study the way you would if you you know were following sort of the more typical direct route. Um, and since that wasn't my reality, I was able to say, you know, I'm going to play to the strengths that I have and setting my own schedule and the timing on that. It was great. I mean, that was, that was massive for me. It was also, it was also good that I, or at least it felt that way to me that I was not testing at the exact same time as everyone in my law school class. When everyone that I graduated with was all in there, they all went at the same time and took the bar exam together. And then we're all scouring the pass list for each other's name. And I was left out of that thankfully. And no one was looking five years later. And then um, I was able to announce it. And um, it was all around pleasant surprise and without any of the pressure that accompanied that. And while that may be a minor thing, it did sort of relieve me because I was like, well, no one's looking. So no one will know if I passed or didn't pass. Um, so the other one is the perspective, which I mentioned a little bit before. But having the perspective to know that your life is waiting on the other side of the bar exam pass or fail, your, your life is waiting on the other side of the bar exam is huge. And, and you know that, you know, this is just an exam because you've experienced life before it. And you know that there will be life after it as well. The final thing that I want to talk about before I kick this back to Celeste is to remember who you are. And you know, you already graduated from law school or even passed the bar in another jurisdiction already. You're the same person. You have those same abilities. You've just added all of these additional positive experiences. And that is who you are. That is still you. Even if you sort of need to reclaim that identity, all of that is who you are. Um, and this is not the main topic that we're talking about here, but I'll just say, you know, reconnecting with law school peers. There were a couple of choice people that I reached out to, to sort of mentor me during when I was going through passing the bar. They were a huge help. And then also, you know, connecting with people from your law school class later can be great for a job search. I was able to get, you know, the job I have now through connections with um, a former law school classmate. And so I think that's, um, it's kind of neat because if you are on a different time track than them, they may actually be in a position to help you get a job when you pass. And that's just sort of a little fun added bonus there. But all right, well, that is sort of my general summary. So I will kick it back to Celeste when she is ready. Okay, so let's switch off who shares. All right. Um, Look at I was having a really good time in chat. This is yeah, I see the that hottest chat. Back in. This oh. has been the hottest chat since um this is so since awesome. we started doing these. There were some good questions in Q and I feel like I feel like I found my people here in chat. <laughs> I know these are really interesting people with great stories. Some people have been gone awesome. out for decades. I already told them about Philip. You know about Philip. Yeah, uh, Philip. Super I, I cool. You should interview super him for cool the article you're doing. Um, yeah, Philip was in his seventies and people, he came to Barmax and was trying to pass the bar. He was in, in his seventies. Not only was Barmax entirely online, he took a bar exam that was, wait, did he do 2020 remote? No, I he think did he, did remote. he did remote. Yeah. He did remote, which was so hard. If you know, Crazy. anything went through that, it freaked everyone out the technology. So he had to not only learn, but all of you, if you did not take your bar exam by typing on exam soft, you will. Um, there right. are very few good reasons for handwriting instead. And I am a slip typist is not one of them. Online yeah. typing tutorials, 10 minutes a day, make it happen. Okay. Because no reason to handwrite the exam. It's a disadvantage. You want to type the exam, 
But that's technology. It's a whole thing that you have to download. If you didn't do this before, if you didn't use ExamSoft in law school, and I didn't, I graduated from law school more than 20 years ago. And when I was in Illinois and took the Illinois bar, I had to use ExamSoft. And it was like, what do you mean there's this thing that's going to freeze off everything else on my computer? Is it going to break my computer? But you know, I did it. And then you have to type in this little box and get all the words. Yeah. In. It was, it was crazy. I um, think the good news is that, you know, you can just engage with the tutorials, you know, like I was, I, like I was saying, like, and you can just practice it. I mean, that's the good thing about that is it's not, it's not like you all yeah. can only use this when you're there of the day of, like, you just true. have to add yeah. it to the list. So, right. I mean, that's the good news there. So, so Philip, he did that and he wrote to me a lot with questions. We do have support in, that can forward questions to the content people, the instructors, if needed. Um, and so he was, he, he asked a few extra questions, but being in his 70s, I'm going to cut him that slack. And man, I was so pleased when he passed and he does pro bono work in his so, a new state now because he had been an attorney in New York and moved somewhere else. Yeah. Now we were also talking about UBE states, so we're going to go there pretty quick. Um, for example, basic components, but we were talking about this. So, um, right. all of the states in red on here are officially UBE states. That means that if you take the bar exam in one, then you can take your score and take it to any of the other states mm -hmm. you know in fact I have known people who have taken it in New Mexico because the accommodations team is better to work with for people with disabilities and accommodations FYI we do have someone here expert on helping you get accommodations from your state hit us up we can help give you a couple hours with her um, she's not on this tutorial but you know she, or a meeting but she's you know part of our company uh, but um, at any rate, and then they just take their score and use it in Texas or Colorado or wherever it is that they needed to be a lawyer. I will. Um, I said in the comments that Wisconsin and Hawaii and also South Dakota are not UBE states, but they might as well be because they are UBE plus a small additional component. So really, um, Hawaii, Wisconsin and South Dakota are very much like the UBE. Um, the other states, the states in gray are special. So um, let's just admit that like New Orleans is the most, or um, Louisiana is the most special of all because this is a civil law um, state that doesn't even use the MBE. So we're, we're taking New, uh, um, our dear Louisiana out of the picture here. You know, the good times may roll, but <laughs> the bar exam that I know does not. <laughs> For sure. Okay, well, but for the rest of these states in, in gray, so we're we're gonna we're gonna say that you know these are effectively. Oh, I wish I had an orange pen here right now, but I don't. But these are effectively orange states, so we're okay with this. We're okay here. We're okay here. So the rest of the states left in gray, you have your own state specific exam. Um, I do talk quite a bit about California in this presentation because we have a full course for California. But if you are a, and, and we do have a tutor who can handle Nevada, we have another tutor who handles Georgia and Florida, both she taught in law school in those states um, and help people prepare for those bar exams. So um, we do have people who can help, but I'm gonna be honest, if you are not in a, if you are in one of these states, either Nevada, Georgia, Florida, um, Delaware, you need to be a self-driven person. And since this is mostly more mature people on this webinar, you probably are. And you can grab some books that will have your state distinctions. And yes, they come from other bar review companies. Don't take their course. Get the book with this state distinctions. It doesn't have to be the most recent one, but um, you can use Barmax for the MBE, learn the state distinctions and get the essays from the state website. Okay. So I know I have one Florida person here. Florida has a fantastic website with all their past essays and sample answers. So you can study for the essay portion on your own. 
Now, most states, not Florida, but everybody else <laughs> has a bar exam that is 50% MBE. That's the multiple choice. So multi-state bar exam or multiple choice portion of the exam and 50% writing. Um, Florida has a little weird thing where they have 50% MBE, but then they have their Florida day. And that is actually, what happened to my pen? Oh, there we go. That's actually part writing. So Florida is a little different. I won't write it, but it's part writing, part Florida multiple choice. Florida multiple choice is a little murky, but um, because they don't release as many of those uh, real past questions and they don't look like MBE questions. But again, half of your exam is the MBE and you do need to take it, Florida. Um, Florida also it may accept a transfer of your MBE score. So look into that. But if you need to take the whole exam, then um, you know we can help you with the MBE part. And we have a tutor if you wish uh, to have help on the uh, Florida or Georgia essays. Uh, but that's not a full course. You know what I mean? If you want a full course, you need to be UBE or one of those UBE plus states or California, um, what we offer. So the basic components of the UBE. So this is my Colorado person and my, you know, New York people. Illinois is UBE. And I'm so annoyed because it switched over like a year after I took the bar exam. <laughs> All the three states I had to take the bar exam in because I moved so much. Three bar exams, people. I had to take three different state bar exams at different points in my career. That um, happened to my friend. She moved out of Pennsylvania and then they switched. Like she took yeah, it. And now they're and all UBE states. states. I, if yeah. I were this generation, I would have taken it once. <laughs> Massachusetts, Texas, Illinois. Those are the bar exams I passed. And Texas had oil and gas. Did I learn oil and gas in law school? No. What the heck? Anyway, I understood it. I, I'm a dirt lawyer. I was. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. Um, the UBE, so all those states that were read and the ones that I said might as well be read, um, are there are um, the uh, multiple choice questions is one full day, the second day of the exam. I could have switched these. So this is Wednesday of the exam. And the essay writing is one full day. It's essays and performance tests. I'll break down. I'll talk a little bit about what each of those is. But you'll have, um, and some states will do the performance test first, and some states do the essay first. Which state were you in, Emily? Alabama, we did essay first. Okay, and Alabama did performance essay test. first. Yes. Yeah, and then there are some people who do performance tests in the morning, essay and afternoon. Uh, but right. the, and that's Tuesday. So Tuesday's the first day, Wednesday's the second day. Well, and ours was actually delayed by four hours, our start time. So all of ours was in the afternoon, actually. It was like oh, afternoon. Oh, because you did that remote exam. <laughs> yeah. So ours was, no, ours wasn't remote. They just had a delay in the start time. So we just sat there for four hours, literally, before we started. So that makes yeah. it like a 13-hour day. It, it was. It was. It was literally a 13-hour day. We went that in, we, we passed me, for four passed, hours. Wait, I didn't even know that. Oh, yeah. It was wild. But, I know your score was like. In the 300s, I'm impressed. I'm very impressed. Yeah. <laughs> I, would have, I would have been like, do we get a nap? What about a yeah, snack? We're here for real. Um, no, I wouldn't have made it. Our mat, I wouldn't I have made it. I am not made for those survival type shows. I am made for coffee and snacks. Um, here are the components of the California bar exam. Okay. We have, um, so uh, the same MBE portion as the other rest of the, you know, as the UBE states. The substantive essay questions, there are fewer essays, but they are longer. And there is only one performance test. So I want you to notice that the performance test here is 90 minutes and the performance mm -hmm. test here is 90 minutes. Back in the old days, California had a three hour performance test. And it wasn't, you know, because of that, it was not like, it's a, it's like a legal task you're supposed to do. If we get time, I'll show you. Um, but it's not, like a, um, it, the old California one wasn't like the MPT. This one's called the MPT, the multi-state mm -hmm. performance test. And, but now ever since they changed over after 2017, July, 2017 onward, the California PT is effectively just the same. They take place in different fictional jurisdictions. That's really the main difference. 
Uh, now that I've seen enough of them, we have a few years worth of data to work from. I think the California ones are a little more straightforward, whereas the MPT writers like to throw some wacky wild stuff at you sometimes. Okay. Uh, but at any rate, you it's a skill you need to learn. So what are the subjects you need to know? Again, if you took a bar exam back in the old days, civil procedure, I, I really got the short end of the stick taking 2015 in Illinois because we were the first year that had civil procedure. Oh, wow. I had not yet done all yes. that clerking for, you know, I've clerked for a bunch of magistrate judges, right. but that was right. later. So in 2015, I knew no civil procedure. I had been a transactional lawyer. If we took my breakdown, I, I mean, I passed, but mm, I'm mm. not feeling good about where I was on civil procedure. I'm not even sure I knew what any of those words meant. Well, um, did you have it in law school? I guess you did. I did, but it was not my strength. Okay. And I guess you also didn't know it was going to be on the bar exam when you were taking it. It was, so. well, it was on the bar exam. It was. Oh, okay. Okay. It was always in the essays, right? So you had, oh, know. I see. I gotcha. You I got gotcha. well it. But then, you know, the MBE questions, they threw that in there. That's crazy. It was <laughs> difficult. My yeah. big struggle was criminal procedure because that's the one I didn't take in law school. That's oh, why yeah. I was wondering because it was huge for me. Like I was up here with everything I took in law school. And then the one that I didn't was like, boom. And I was like, yeah, so, and yeah. criminal procedure. Okay. So we teach it all as one thing. We actually, where I went to law school, I, you know, I went to Harvard and they throw it all in one semester criminal gotcha. law procedure. So it's all in one semester. So that's kind of what we do. We throw it all in one course called crimes. Um, um, the first five sections are criminal law and the last two sections are criminal procedure. Gotcha. But one of those lectures is one of the two longest lectures in our course. And I can show you, I'll get into the website later and show you what it looks like. So that module on fourth, fifth, and sixth amendments is like, I want to say it's two hours. It's like two hours or something. Yeah. He's one of the more verbose professors too. But the outlines are pretty streamlined. Like this right here is our California course. Um, this is all the outlines. So if you are familiar with a bar review course that gives you a big pile of books that were like, you know, they had to chop down a whole lot of trees. We chopped down fewer trees. We, <laughs> we have this one slim book. This is all the outlines, all the hard, like black letter law that you need. That's California. UBE is about the same size, maybe a few pages slimmer. So even though I'm talking a long lecture there about um, the Fourth Amendment, Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments, um, overall the lectures are short and some of the segments are, you know, six minutes on what's a trust, you know, <laughs> something like that. So some of the lecture segments are very short and some are long, depending on how much tested material is in that subject. So we have a uh, civil procedure, criminal law and procedure, constitutional law, that is the U.S. Constitution. Um, they test a broad range of subjects there, but I would say First Amendment is one of the greatest hits. Um, and then contracts, uh, good old contracts, um, evidence, again, federal rules of evidence, um, real property and torts. This is how it's tested on the multiple choice. Um, on the, um, the, for the multiple choice part of the exam. Now in the essay portion of the exam, this is actually less than 30% in California, but in the essay portion of the exam, you could be tested on any one of those. So like I was telling you earlier, we, Melissa, um, Emily, we could have had a civil procedure essay. I understand, yeah. Yeah, we probably didn't, assuming I passed. No, no, I'm sure we did. Cause back then they always had a civil procedure essay. I remember the torts essay was the one about the kid in the snowmobile. Oh, I, <laughs> I teach that essay now. It's a fabulous way to learn negligence. So, um, yeah. Back then, uh, Illinois had a word limit and they don't anymore because it's the UBE. But right. I'm just at the bottom of that box real quick. Uh, <laughs> a lot of issues in that essay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so plus there are additional essay subjects. Now I just took a screenshot from our um, page, our homepage. So here are the additional subjects that you need to know for essays in those UBE states. Okay. Yeah. Secure transactions, don't let that one scare you. It is super easy. It is basically like 
the loans secured by collateral. And there's four things they want you to know. And they test the same four things over <laughs> and do. over. So just get in, learn it well. It'll go from something that you don't know what a secured transaction is to like, oh, that's, I'm going to ace that essay. I hope it's on the exam because I can get a six out of six every time. Like seriously, and you can do that. In well, and day for day for Burmex students, there's the like office hours on secure transactions that literally like I've had multiple tutoring students be like, I can never pass secure transactions. They watch it and I'm like, I hope I get one. I hope I get secure transactions. Ah, that's the one I taught them. Thank you. I did this crazy chart where I'm no like, good. look, this is a mind map. This is everything you no need good. to know yeah. for secure transactions. This and is not one of our three videos. One of the questions that has come up is whether this video will be posted. This video will be posted on YouTube. Um, someone's a little behind the ball on editing videos. And I didn't tell my boss, hey, go ahead and do this for me because uh, he's busy too. So I am going to do it and I will get some video editing done. Um, and we will get these posted up to the YouTube channel. So this and other recent um, webinars will be available. But there is some content, obviously, that's only in the site because, you know, we can't give away everything for free. So one of those is the office hour that I did on secure transactions. So agency and partnership and corporations, um, these together, like in California, this is called business associations. Um, so you may see it called that on your, you know, on a list of, uh, of you know, a so it's not a cost. Anyway, business associations. These are the UBE subjects, but we break it up, agency and partnerships in one uh, little, lecture and corporations in another. Uh, trusts, wills, family law. Then conflicts of law is about when you have uh, state A and state B law con are conflicting on a point, which one should apply mm -hmm. um, to any particular dispute. It's a little arcane. It's not heavily tested. And if it is tested, it's tested in an essay about other things. So again, we have an office hour that tells you what are the issues that have come up and how do you need to know how to answer them. Uh, but again, you'll look at essays. We're going to talk about study techniques in a bit. You'll look at essays and you'll get it down because there's not, it's one of those ones where it's like, oh, that's arcane, but there's not much to know. So really these are pretty, you know, these are mostly pretty simple. The, the things that listed in the column on the right, they're very short lectures. There's not a whole lot necessary in there. What, so which one freaked you out, Emily? So what I was initially you? scared of secure transactions until I did your, until I did your video. Um, the other one that I was, that I was worried about, like I said, was criminal procedure, just because I ended up having to put in, I would say like three times the study time on criminal procedure that I did mm -hmm on any of the other classes. And that's one reason why one of my recommendations was assess where you're at before you try to plan out your study schedule, whether you've actually encountered these subjects before. It turned out, you know, I, I didn't really know with secure transactions where I stood. I didn't know with criminal procedure where I stood. One of those, it took almost no study time, right? It was an unknown, but then it was fine. The other right. one it was an unknown and it took a whole lot of time, but it helped that I knew what my unknowns were before I got into it. I knew what my unknown quantities were. And then with the other ones, I sort of knew where I stood, where I was like, okay, you know, I booked torts. I'm probably not going to have a ton of trouble, like pulling that back up, you know, versus this over here that I really don't know where Emily's I stood. Emily's pretty all. smart. <laughs> Celeste went to Harvard. <laughs> Somehow, we can pick on each other if you want, but no, yeah. we can pick on each other. Yeah. No, she's, yeah. she's smarty pants. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that, that was, I, that I was get true. to hire smarty pants. The yeah. job, by the way, that Emily says the job I have now, she has a day job as a lawyer and yes. um, does work for, for Barmax around the edges. And I keep for grabbing sure. her time. Like I'm her like real boss. Um, <laughs> and I appreciate it, Emily. I appreciate, you know, all you I do. love it. So, you know, you know. Here. So yeah, so so these can be essays and they quite often are contracts. Essays can be a little challenging because you have to identify, you know, which issue are they even asking you to write about? But, you know, you'll learn that. You'll figure it out. We'll talk about the techniques. Again, this stuff works. We have this dude here working 50 hours a week. Wild. 
one hour commute each way to work and two toddlers. Now this was a, uh, he would listen to the lectures during his commute and then practice in the time that he had available. You know, we have other, uh, I threw a couple other testimonials into this. Um, this guy, look at this. Okay, so I didn't talk about passing scores, but to pass in say New York and a whole lot of other states is 266. The scores right. range from 260 to 280 that your state would consider passing. So if you are in Alaska, you need that 280, but we should all aim for 280 or above in case the dream job in Alaska ever opens up, right? So aim for that 280 or, yeah. or above um, and, uh, and you can pass in any state. This dude, he kind of blew that 280 goal out of the water. He got a 316. So I want you to know that what we're doing works and you will find Absolutely. methods that work for you. But I think the mental game stuff and the set your schedule, you know, make a plan, stick to it, do what works with your life and schedule that Emily gives, so that's gonna apply to all of you. Um, oh, yeah. So basic subjects for California. Uh, again, you could have essays on any of these things, but now, oh, that was not a pen. Uh, <laughs> this is a fun program. And I, if I were, yeah, if I were using it a little more, I'd be more smooth. Um, so for these two subjects, civil procedure and evidence, you could be tested on California distinctions. Mm. So we have them included in the bar max outline in different types. So you can in this California distinction so that you'll know if the federal hearsay rule says this and the California hearsay rule says that, um, then when you're taking the exam, you're looking, is this question taking place in a California state court or is it taking place in a federal court? And I know which rule to apply. And on the MBE, you're going to apply the federal rule because the MBE does not care about California law. Right. <laughs> um, and neither do you for the purposes of the bar exam when it comes to these other subjects. These other subjects, you answer, well, constitutional laws, the U.S. Constitution and Supreme Court case, cases. So that applies everywhere. But for these common law subjects, criminal law, contracts, um, real property and torts, um, you apply generally applicable principles of law. You do not need to know your California distinctions. What a relief, right? You do need to know these additional essay areas. The biggie is professional responsibility. Mm. We did a complete overhaul of our um, professional responsibility course a couple of years ago because California did a complete overhaul of its uh, um, professional responsibility code in 2018 in order to kind of um, make it closer match the model rules. It used to be that California was the only state with its own numbering system, its own thoughts and plans and ideas. Anyway, no, I'm sorry. I was, I'm from California. <laughs> My family still lives there, but come on. Uh, so now <laughs> professional responsibility in California is a little bit more like other states, but of course, lots of distinctions. You need to be ready to identify and address ethical issues that attorneys face in the essays on the exam. Agency and partnerships and corporations together, that's called um, uh, business associations. We cover LLCs uh, along with corporations here. Trust, wills, and community property, kind of related, right? It's all about who gets somebody's stuff. <laughs> Divorced, <laughs> dead, trying to make, you know, detailed plans for the way they want to leave the world. Let go, people, let go. Anyway, um, so that's the essays. That's the essays. And, you know, again, some of you might know the format for writing essays, whether it's California or the MEE you know, we're recommending the use of a format called IRAC that you may have seen in law school issue rule, application conclusion. Um, there are resources to teach you that within BarMax and elsewhere on the internet, but um, the best way to learn it is to practice. So we're going to get to 
techniques for all of it in a minute. But I don't want to leave out the performance test. Um, I really should have inserted one. Uh, I'm trying to think if I can open one really quick. because I didn't open one in my other file. Anyway, what it is, is you get a file, you get a like paper because it's not the remote exam anymore. It's, you know, right. you'll, be there, you'll be there in the room. Yeah. And you will um, get a packet. It's what, about 20 pages? Yeah. It's, it's like a little stapled together booklet. Yeah. Now I first encountered that in Texas and um, cause they did it in both Texas and I think Illinois. I don't know. I just remember the Texas one. I was like, Oh good. I get to write a client letter. You know, that was <laughs> like a break from answering questions for me because you know, I was a lawyer at the time. So. <laughs> anyway. Um, but it's something like that. You might have to write a memo to your uh, boss. Uh, you might have to write the argument section of a brief to give to a judge, um, in which case you're presenting an argument. Now, how do you know to write this? You don't need to know the law. You do need to know generally how courts work. You need to know how to read a precedent. <laughs> you need to know, you know about the law because what you're going to get all your information from are your file and your library. So first you read the little assignment memo you're given, then you read your library we always tell people, skip the file until you know what the law is. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of ways to approach how to do this task, but, um, but at least read the library first and you'll see what the law is by reading cases, by reading statutes, by reading regulatory opinions. That's the law. You're given a little library and you will, look at the library and figure out what the rules are that's going to govern this dispute of your client that you've learned about. And then you'll go read the rest of the pile, file, which will have some pages from a deposition transcript or a police report or... Uh, yeah. Yeah, like... Um, an like, interview, like a, a interview, like one person will be interviewing the other, like an employee interview is like one I've seen a bunch, yeah. Yeah, a client interview... Or also sometimes it's the motion that your opponent filed that yeah. you're supposed to respond to. So if your opponent made three points and you need to shoot them each down, guess what? Your memo has three sections or your brief has three sections. You know, it's absolutely. So, yeah. So you, um, so that's what it is. It's a practical. You have to, you, sorry. Oh, I was just saying the hard thing is filtering all the extraneous information there because they do sure. give you so many facts there. Yeah, sorry, yeah there's a lot of good stuff and it's it's making the most of what stuff are relevant. There's a lot of good stuff in there. It's making the most of what's relevant. The hard thing I think is timing because the oh, fact yeah. that you as a competent attorney were given this assignment, you would, and you know, told I need this tomorrow, you would spend four hours on it tonight and then proofread it with fresh eyes tomorrow. Like that's, that's you would for real. A competent lawyer. If you were good at time management, you would actually maybe have gotten this assignment in enough time that you would have a few days to think about it and put it in your calendar. But they say if you don't finish it in the 90 minutes, if you haven't gotten to all the sections, whatever there are, then they're going to dock you for what they call time management. I'm like, no, baby, that's not time management. <laughs> Being able to rush consistently. You have to rush to get it done. There's no way to get it done but to rush. So the way to get there is practice, 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 practice. Okay, that's how we get there. So what are our strategies? Um, first of all, um, uh, cha -cha -cha -cha. Delaware is not UBE. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to see whether there's anything big I need to hit up. Um, yeah, Delaware is not UBE. It is its own beast, um, I think. Yeah, Delaware. Isn't Delaware? Yeah, Delaware's the only one in, that wasn't great there. I'm pretty sure that's not UBE because Delaware corporate law is so important, you know. Um, so, okay. What we recommend is something that we call active study, um, doing open book problems. And um, I'm going to so what I would be doing if I were in the BarMax course in, I think I'm in the UBE course, no, I'm in the California course right here, but it doesn't matter because I'm going to work on some questions about federalism in my constitutional law course. 
federalism only gets nine minutes in the lecture. Um, so when I'm listening to the lecture, I can look at the outline, I can mark up the outline, um, I can make it a little bigger because come on, I'm over 50. There we go. Um, I can also use the outline here in my book, it's the same. I can do flashcards if I want to remind myself of these rules, but you're gonna see that to me, memorization comes later. Um, let me get out of here. Uh, this is one of the older, there we go. But I can also do multiple choice questions, mm -hmm. both after the lectures and there are bigger sets of multiple choice questions that I can do in order to practice. Um, so as I'm doing a question, um, I will read the question and then I'll read the call of the question and then I will stop. Uh, oh, I have to use my pencil, sorry. Do I? I don't know why this isn't. Anyway, I I am off. Usually we have it on the website too. So I'm more often yeah. doing it on the website than here. Um, da, 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 da. And when I was studying, I did a bunch on my phone, to be honest. Yes. A lot of the people who were in the testimonials were saying that the ability to do questions on the go was so helpful to them. At any rate, what I recommend is that let's say you have this, the app, this is the app, you have it on your phone and you have um, the outline either on your laptop screen because we have it on our beautiful website as well. I can show that or you have it in your in your hot little hand. You will read the call of the question. You will read the uh, question facts. Don't read the answer choices. Figure out what rules would I need to know to answer this question? Sometimes it's hard to tell, but usually from the facts and the call of the question alone, even without looking at the answer choices, you know which rule you need to know. Well, rather than using that question to test yourself, when the bar exam is three months or two months away, that's when the test is, right? Don't use this question to test yourself. This is a real past MBE question. Let's use it as a study tool. Let's use the question to teach ourselves. So we're gonna look at our question and we're gonna go and, you know, now I'm on the MBE questions page. This time I'll do contracts. I have 256 contracts questions here. And I might, uh, you know, read one, and say, okay, in an action, oh, I need to be in study mode. That was my problem. In yeah, an action go. against Gourmet for breach of contract, Hope will probably, you know, and then I'm going to read the facts and decide what rules do I need to look up to know the answer. And I will look at these in the outline. So I have my phone with the question and my computer with the outline side by side, or I have two screens open on my computer, or I'm using my book. That way I can use this question to remind myself of the rules. I feel like I'm not as explaining it as well as I have in the past. There is within Barmax an office hours page where I have the office hour where I explained all this in great detail, including, um, yeah, this is just evidence. Um, and this was the first office hours I watched as a student. Was really? Open book study. <laughs> Good. We actually recommend it in the calendar. So you were following right. directions. Yeah, that's that's yeah. why. Yeah. Okay. So so this is the the one here on the left. Um, so why? How was this helpful to you? So this is actually how I started studying. And the reason that I liked it is because, you know, since I did have limited time, I felt like I was doing two things at once every time I sat down to study, because I was like, I am learning either how to answer these questions or how to structure my essay. And I'm learning content at the same time. So I felt like I was doubling up on every minute that I was putting in for study time, which was rewarding to me because I was having to 
force those minutes to exist. And so that that's why it was it was helpful mainly is because it was just super motivating to feel like I'm doing two things at once. I'm accomplishing so much. <laughs> and that, that was a great way to look at it, you know, um, bec- and but you say it is two things. And some people don't think that they think, OK, just give me all the rules I need to memorize and then I'll go take the test. Right. Unfortunately, the MBE questions are super tricky and you really want to do a lot of past real questions to learn these people's tricks. Oh yeah. The one about like the selling the horse that drove me so mad that I put it in our contract defenses um, office hours when we were doing that, because like there was this one specific MBE question that like I was waking up at night trying to think about this. And so then when I was doing an office hours, I'm like, I'm going to explain all this to you. So you don't wake up in the middle of the night. Like I did. Oh my gosh. The horse selling the horse. (laughs) Anyway, yeah, I, I wonder, I, I wonder, hmm. there anyway. are some questions that you got to wonder who, like, whether there were just little imps, you know, minions of Satan, I don't know, somebody running around the NCB office writing these questions. Some of them are not nice questions. I know students that come in, because when you do do questions, there's a message board and students can ask questions in the message board and have an instructor answer. And I've gone in there and people say, well, this is a terrible question. It shouldn't be in bar max. And I have to say, you know, baby, it's a past bar exam question. If we're going to get ahead, it has to be here. We can't just show you the pretty ones. They're <laughs> ugly. So yes, you practicing the questions is a different skill. So you're learning how to do the questions, but you're also learning the substantive law in an active way. And in this, um, I don't know. There's about nine minutes toward the beginning of this video. I think it starts at minute six of open book bar study. The one here with the little books stacked um, about the difference between active and passive study and the kinds of activities that qualify as each and forcing yourself to learn how to do the problem is far more active than just selecting an answer choice and then reading the answer explanation. So that's what we encourage. We encourage you to engage in active study by doing problems. Um, so how did you use active study or open book study when it came to essays, Emily? Um, so what I did with the essays often is I wasn't always, I tried to always write out at least one, but a lot of them, I was just writing out an outline. But mm-hmm. then what I tried to do was see what I could do and then go to the actual, I liked the physical book, but go to the Barmex outline, whether the physical one or not, and figure out what other things I could plug in. So a lot of times what I would do is take the full time and write as much as I could, then take another 30 minutes and build my essay out completely with what wow. was in the with, with what was in the uh, the outline. And so that would be like one of my three hours. So that was like close to open and you would spend it yes. on one, one essay. That is, mm-hmm. that is fantastic. So California people, that would take you even a little longer because your essays are longer. So don't be afraid to spend the time if what you're doing is active and it is getting you to understand more deeply. Exactly. And I tried to focus on subjects that were more difficult when I was writing them out. And then to cut time down, I would just outline them. And then I would try to give myself 15 minutes and the other 15 minutes to fill in the full outline with the open books. So I sort of right. like gave myself half the time if I was doing the outline and then fully wrote it out if it was like. And, and when you book. say outline, talk to me about how much was in this so-called outline of yours. Sometimes people are confused because they think about the outlines that they wrote of their, you know, their book or their uh Right. There were re- reports that they had to do in junior high. I usually had like, I had my issue. I had like the, the rules were the most lengthy. And then when I got down, so it was like a couple of sentences. And then when I got down into analysis, I was not always writing out the facts because a lot of times I would do them physically have the essay printed out that I was working on. And I would like circle the facts. And sometimes I would even just number them. And so it would be like, Number one pairs to this element of the rule. Number two pairs to this element of the rule. But it was just where I had circled. So then if I were actually going to 
to write it out, I would have to find a summary way to describe that sentence in a couple of words. But if I was writing the outline, I didn't always, I didn't always take the time to do that. And I actually did that on the bar exam. Um, I was like circling sentences that I knew were a fact I was going to bring over and everything like that. So that was a technique that I, all we got was a number two pencil, but that was, that was absolutely, that was absolutely what I did. I did my like circle number, circle number to pair them to the elements. Wow. Of the yeah. So I find that scribbling on paper is helpful for my um, you know, <laughs> engaging in written stuff as well, scribbling on paper. Um, but uh you know, even without a number system, we do encourage people pair pair all the elements of your rule to a fact. So we want you at first doing your essays um, in that open book way where you are looking at the rule to the extent you don't know it. Um, after a while, uh, first of all, early on, turn in one of those essays, even if you spent an hour on it, like Emily did for her early essays, and you spent twice the time that you were supposed to spend, and you cheated by looking at the book. <laughs> Why turn that in? I cheated. It's not cheating. It's part of your study process. And don't look at a sample answer before you turn it in. Don't look at, for the UBE essays, there's this um, NCBE answer explanation. Don't look at that. Okay, don't look at an answer. Right. But do all you can based on the question and the rules in the book. Worry about memorizing them later. Learn how to apply them first. Okay. And so do everything you can. Turn in the best essay you can. I hope not two hours, maybe an hour and a half for California, 45 minutes for MBE, uh, MEE, to, you know, one and a half times what you would take. And turn that in to Barmax. We have an essay submission portal that operates year round it'll turn on and you'll have access to the full course and all the materials the day you buy it. Okay. We don't have Incredible. like this blackout period. And then, okay, you know, on May 1st, everybody wants to start studying for the bar because the reality is that's not how everybody's life is. Some people right. are studying for the bar for longer. So it's open now. Now there might be some changes and you'll say, Oh, what happened? But you know, we change it. We try to do as much of our changing as we can. And this, this is the off season, right? Because it gets, you know, gets a little nutty around here in May. <laughs> forget about June and July, but practice one or two or even three essays very early in your process. You upload to that board and we have people who are working now. We've got about four essay graders who I haven't seen you in there, Emily, uh, but you've been a little busy with this. But we have about four essay graders who go, they check the board every day. If there's an essay, one of them will grab it. You know, um, if there's a couple essays, one of them will grab a couple essays. So, um, and during peak season, there's maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 of us in there uh, grading essays and taking a lot of essays. So get it and get your feedback. You'll get the feedback within a day because there's not a big long line. And so a day, maybe two you'll get your feedback and you'll be able to see, am I on the right track with the writing? Am I doing this issue, rule, application, or analysis, whatever you want to call the A, conclusion correctly, especially this? Am I writing out a correct rule statement? And am I pairing every element of that rule with a fact from the problem? Even if it seems super obvious, I have to state it. I can't just come to the conclusion. Because here's the rule. So here's the conclusion. No, there is some word in the problem that tells you, you know, 90 miles an hour shows that, you know, the defendant was, you know, being negligent because, you know, driving at an excessive speed, you know, like you have to use the word 90 miles an hour or whatever it is that's in there. Like, mm -hmm. gosh, what was the one, you know, the cheesecake was flattened and dirty on the floor. So it showed it had been there for a while. You oh. flattened and dirty piece of cheesecake. <laughs> right. on the floor. That, was, that was pretty stupid. Yeah. But that wasn't the part of that problem that bothered me. The part of the problem that bothered me was like the, the six-year-old visually impaired, whatever. I forget what sports, man, what are they doing to us? Anyway, yeah. share feedback early. My first essay that I submitted to the portal, I didn't, it was not a passing score. Just to give everyone perspective of like how much it can steer your direction. <laughs> it right. was great. And there are plenty of people who do not take this advice. And then, you know, it's coming up to the deadline for submitting essays and they turn in five essays 
You've seen this. Right, right. They're, right. Yeah. Busy. They're turning five essays that all have the same basic flow. Well, and the problem is by then you form the habit. You know, I mean, so much of when we get in there and you're under pressure, you are going to, whether you intend to or not, you're going to follow your, your habits that you've already formed. And that is the other reason I would say, like, it's so, it's so important to do it early because like before you form your habit of how you respond to the question. Right. That's great. Well, and you're going to, because I always look at it, like use your feedback and apply it to do another example. But throughout that whole time, you're building a habit. You're building a habit of how to Absolutely. reflect. That is a great insight. Um, so you're going to do practice uh, essays this way. You're going to do practice MBEs, open book. Eventually, I do want you to start. Oh, and you're going to do practice um, California performance test or multi-state performance test. You're going to do them this way too. You'll you'll do some and turn them in for grading. It's really good to pretty soon get to where you're at least writing some timed essays and timed PTs because timing is hard and you'll write a very different essay if you're given twice the time. So you have to learn how to write that passing essay in that amount of time. So okay. while I would encourage you to begin open book, taking a lot of time pretty quickly on essays, I want you to move to timed essays or timed PTs within the time that you will have on the exam. And again, some of them you'll self-check, but every now and then you'll upload one to the portal and see how you're doing. You get 10 essay reviews with your program, but they're fairly inexpensive um, if you decide you want another, uh, you know, if you want to buy another two or three or another 10. Um, I think we sell we sell them in a bundle, 10 for 200. I think still that price hasn't changed in a while. Uh, for current bar max students, um, they're more if you are a current student. Um, anyway, then you will get to where you're doing practice tests, and practice tests are when we say, okay, on the exam day itself, that multiple choice, you are going to do 100 questions in three hours in the morning, and you are going to do 100 questions in three hours in the afternoon. And it's brutal and it makes your eyes bleed. <laughs> it's just, I mean, it's your, your brain is swimming and it's almost like it's an endurance test. If you've ever known anybody trained for a marathon, you know, they're running, they're doing their little, you know, their three mile run, their five mile run. But then on the weekend, you know, if they have a normal work schedule, they do their long run. And that long run starts at, you know, 10 miles or, you know, well, six, if you're, I don't know, with me, it would start at the two mile run. But anyway, uh, yeah, you know, they, then they're getting to where they're doing 12 miles and then they're doing 15, 18, 20, 21 miles because they have to run 26 the day that the, the I was going to say the exam, the test. No, <laughs> they're running a race. They have to run 26 the day of the race. There is a physical component. I can't believe you sat there another four hours. Anyway, there is a physical component to um, sitting there at the exam site, not being able to, you know, wander off to your refrigerator when you need a brain break or, you know, go play with the dog. Thank goodness for, for dogs and refrigerators. Um, coffee pots. No, you can't do any of that. You're stuck there. So give yourself exam like condition and do three hour blocks. If your schedule does not permit three hour blocks, do 90 minute blocks. Okay. Mm -hmm. 50 questions in 90 minutes and no interruptions, no pausing, same thing. Okay. Um, that's for the MBE. Do the same for the essays. It is six essays. In three hours, that is hard. So at least try doing three in 90 minutes. The reason why is because you have to stop. You have to have an internal timer. They don't say time at 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. They give you all morning and a packet with six questions and a computer with six boxes to type your answer. So you have to set internal timers. You know, you can do that in exam soft. Did you use the internal timers? Um, so I didn't, they had a big clock, like a big, 
visual, physical, ginormous clock sitting wall in clock for people that can still read clocks with hands. It was, no, it was digital, and it was it was, it was digital. Oh, it was digital, and it was like it was like ticking. I'd off. be better with the hands. I kind of hated it because it was like it was like flat, like it was like really bright red and like giant, like up there. But it was fine. I mean, I didn't need a timer because this was like in my face. But on the other hand, I was just like, I really want to look at you (laughs) because it was it was so giant. It was like breathing down your neck. Right. I didn't practice using the exam soft timers because I didn't know there was going to be a giant one on the wall. But then I felt it was very redundant. But it wasn't set in thirty minute increments. It was just. There. It was just the three hour countdown. A three hour that countdown. Awful. It was intense. <laughs> I mean, we use those countdown clocks at my gym, but like, well, we were sort of in a gym, to be honest. <laughs> I took mine on a basketball court. Yeah, that's what we were in. <laughs> so it was yeah. fitting. <laughs> basketball court. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Six essays, three hours. And then in the afternoon, two PTs. And so, Doing two PTs in three hours, that's really subjecting yourself to torture. But if you really want to feel ready for the exam, then then do it. Also, even if you don't, you're probably not going to do this all in one day. There is a complete practice exam that's 200 questions. You could mm-hmm. do three hours in the morning, give yourself an hour for lunch, three hours in the afternoon. If you can't do that, do one at some point in the morning and one at some point in the afternoon, just so you can get the feeling of working through that more, whichever is your more tired, less attentive part of the day. Because we're having you do most of your studying at your most attentive part of the day, but the exam is not gonna line itself up for your convenience. So practice test time, test-like conditions, this is a part of it. What we have not talked about is memorization. I'm writing here, there is brute force memorization. It happens, okay? It happens and you have to do it but we have our students do it that last, okay? It sounds upside down to a lot of people. Why does it work, Emily? Well, you've already learned it. And for me, having the knowledge before I tried to memorize, it made sure my gut feeling was going in the right direction because I'd already deep learned it. And then I could memorize on top of the deep learning. On the other hand, trying to memorize it before I had understood it, it would have been blind memorization. And they never give you the straight answer. They never give you the straight question, right? Like you can't just approach it and and apply the memorized rule. There's always some twist, some quirk, some weird something. And without the deep knowledge first, I don't even know that the memorization is is even that helpful. Plus you want to make sure that you peak when the exam actually happens. So if you memorize last you can only hold so much in your head at one time. So you've got as much as you possibly can in there on the day of the exam. Yes. So two yeah, reasons, the cram drawer is filled with the exam. There is no grocery list in the cram drawer in your brain. You know, there's, yeah. you, know, you know, don't know anyone's birthday. You don't know. Oh my gosh, no. My, but my I could friend. shake you awake in the middle of the gun night and go, well, you're saying, you would say, you're Ready. saying, no, of course, statement off of truth, prove the truth of the matter asserted. You're saying it's inadmissible unless okay. an assumption or exception applies. Sir. It's so funny that you said hearsay. No, it's so funny that you said hearsay because the story that I have is I was driving home from the grocery store, which was a pickup. It was a grocery pickup, mind you, because I can't think enough to go into a grocery store and figure out what we need. So I did the pickup. I'm driving home and I'm going through hearsay exceptions in my head. And I right. like watch the car, leave the milk on the floor, run and grab my outline to figure out what was the last one that I couldn't remember the entire time I was driving home. Because you have a visual outline. Yes. <laughs> yes. Sometimes um, sometimes writing your outlines, we have another video on memorization uh, strategies, techniques for uh, memorization and review. And charting is a big one for yes. a lot of people because you know that it's, you know, the third thing down on the right and that you skipped it. <laughs> you know? That's how, that's how I took my first bar exam. I had to know Massachusetts because this was before the UBE. I had to know federal right. and Massachusetts evidence. And um, so I had like all the rules of evidence down the middle, but then the things that were specific to one or the other, the, like it was a different color off to the right or the left. I mean, basically columns. And I had all of evidence that I needed to know on, uh, you know, it wasn't eight and a half by 11. It was nine by 12 sheet of art paper with pencil. So you can write pretty small. Different right, colors. right. 
it was, it was, you know, that's what worked for me. (laughs) Um, Right. You know, I, uh, yeah, anyway, but you, but the real cramming part of it. So you're building that as you go along. You don't create that for the bar exam. You work from that. You create that while you're doing questions and then you cram from it the week before the bar exam and you're walking around the house uh, muttering the exceptions to the warrant requirement because that is a highly tested thing in criminal procedure. Um, Anyway, I had posted some of these testimonials earlier. This was somebody whose testimonial was short and and sweet. Um, More than 10 years out of law school passed with over 40 points to spare using bar maps. Um, this uh, person here, uh, she was a full-time practicing attorney, but she had not taken a bar exam in nearly eight years and, you know, apparently moved to California, which, you know, <laughs> you know res- California doesn't have reciprocity with anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and she found the bar max approach really worked for her because she could use the app anywhere. Um, so this, you know, there are, again, more on our website. This is definitely what we um, recommend. This is the website. But there is a lot of Q&A. Uh, before I jump into q and I've been kind of telling you all good things about bar max. This is our uh, pricing for either the BarMax UBE or the BarMax California course, the um, BarMax MBE only for those of you in a state that does not use the UBE or California, uh, the BarMax MBE only is um, I think 999 uh, and this is the pricing for the courses. We also offer tutoring. We haven't talked about tutoring. Emily is one of our tutors. I love tutoring. It's so fun. Yeah. Um, I, I remember your first session because uh, you were having a technical. So yes. Yes. We ran yes. the Zoom yeah. through my computer and yes. I, I launched the meeting and you ran it and I went yeah. and then I came back and I We didn't have there. a Zoom link. Yes. Yeah, sometimes you and I have some some fun Zoom issues, don't we? But yeah, we, we got there. And honestly, <laughs> it's was just... my bedtime. Yes. Uh, yeah, that was funny. I was like, I don't know, reading in bed, and then I came and turned off the Zoom. That was a fun one. But yeah, I could see from that moment that I made a good hire. Um, so, so, so these it's are so the prices great. for tutoring. Um, you know, the more hours you buy, the uh, less expensive it is per hour. So we're going to take some Q&A on this blank page. Um, I received, okay, so the MBE book, somebody had a question about our books. We also have a book to use over here while taking the MBE practice it test. Here's my outlines. <laughs> yeah, so we want you to use uh, the book here and we give you bubble sheets because those good old Scantron bubble sheets, you know, technology from, I don't know, was I using these in definitely, you know, the SAT and all that back in the day? Oh yeah. Um, you you will use those. So we have a bubble sheet. And um, it's hard because I don't have a green screen, obviously. Um <laughs> white disappears, but we have a bubble sheet and an answer key. But somebody said, well, it's just the questions. The answer explanations are in bar max, um, always for the wrong answer, often for the right answer as well. We've been backloading. We got another 50 of those uploaded this week. Originally, we didn't have wrong answer explanations for most of the questions because with the open book method and the fact that we also have a message board to answer questions for, that come up if you have a, okay, here's why I thought it was B, and then an instructor will respond. Uh, but people wanted the explanation written out. We were hesitant because it's a more passive form of study. But of course, you know, people are are saying, hey, we really need that. So we're putting it in. Um in terms of wrong answer explanations, but we are here to answer any questions along the way. And if you look in the message board associated with each question in the past 15, 20 years (laughs) since we've had that feature, I don't know, 15 years. No, 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 15. No, 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 not 20. Barmax was launched in 2010. So we're at 13 years now. So in the past 13 years, someone has um, had that question and um, right. 
Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's a single question I got stumped on that someone hadn't discussed it in the message board. Like after I'd done the open book, if, oh, if I had the open book and I couldn't figure out the answer on a question that I got wrong, pretty much somebody had talked about it in the message board. That is great. So there's a message board associated with each question. I can jump into that feature in a minute. So yes, um, for the person that was Lenny who asked, um, and uh, the answers are online. So fill in your answers here, score yourself from that, but then enter your answers online as you review them, because you want to review the ones that you got right, as well as the ones you got wrong. Right. Uh, one technique I recommend is mark the ones that you have a question about, because usually we're torn between two answers. We're like, it's either C or D. And it depends on whether, you know, a whatchamacallit is a thing or not, you know, because they write something in there and you're like, or does that, uh, you know, you're not quite sure about the phrasing of one of the answer choices. Well, what if you get it right and you're only reviewing the ones you got wrong? No, sure. it because if you get it wrong, if you get it right, you know, you need to review that anyway. So, so pick answer choice D, but put a big old question mark next to C so that when you're going back through them later, you'll know, okay, I've got to go find the rule that makes C wrong. That's right. Because there is a reason C is wrong. And you are training yourself to eliminate wrong answers by doing the yeah. open book method when you study. And the only time uh, the first time you should be doing questions and worried about your timing and all that is practice tests. And then if you find that timing is an issue, then you can do timing drills. Um, anyway. Yeah. So yeah that's I, what I say to my tutoring students is I say the ones you got wrong and the ones you got right, but you're not sure how you got there. <laughs> yes. Um, Short yeah. version. You, you explain better, but yeah. <laughs> so, um, so there's a bunch of questions that have been answered. And I did you take care of all those people? Um, I, yeah, I, I've been doing it while you were talking as much as okay, I could. Okay, good. Yeah. So um, some of these, you know, just in case of anything needed to be handled live, I think people can see. Uh, but uh, essays one day, MBE one day, um, just if there's anything here that needs to go live before I get to the unanswered question. Yeah, let's, let's, when well, some of the- Is there anything that everybody should hear? You know what I mean? Yeah, there was like one about active study and then you got there, oh, right? I got there. Okay. There was there was some stuff about active that. Active study. Oh yeah, I see. Okay. Optimal ways to use bar max. Okay, so I will show you some um other good office hours that you could look at. Um that so we can talk where you can find out more, okay? About uh study methods and we'll we'll browse around in there. Um cuz these are good questions. Uh so yeah, there's some good stuff in here. I to make sure one. everyone got a quick answer, but let's, yeah. Okay. And this one was the same. I answered that one. What do you offer in terms of PT instruction for California? Okay, uh, Peter, that is a good question. That's a good segue to what I wanted to do. So I'm in the California course on my app and in the <laughs> UBE course on my computer, just so that if I needed to show both, I could. But um, right now we're gonna make the filter a little easier to use. But if you go to performance tests, because they are effectively the same now, we don't teach them separately. We teach them together, okay? So we have um, the first performance test workshop I did. Oh my goodness. I could show you guys this video, but it'll be a little tough for me to back out of it. My, um, my screen was like to hear, this was before the pandemic and we all figured out how to properly use Zoom and all of that, right? So like, I'm so low tech in that video, um, it, you know, and I'm not most high tech person in the world today, but not either. despite the embarrassing use of technology in that video, I stand by the content. <laughs> the content is still good. That when I streamed on January 6th of 2020, before we all knew it was about to hit us. And, um, and it teaches about the um, performance test. It teaches my strategy. Uh, the one called remote exam approaches to the MPT, the one with that big orange box here in the middle. This one, even though it was pitched as toward the remote exam, I got approaches from two other instructors in there that was really helpful to hear. So Melissa has a detailed approach that involves a lot of note-taking. Um, and Whitney, 
who teaches about half the material in that seminar is um, the exact opposite. Whitney's approach was she realized that she was not being successful when she got too bogged down in notes, that what Mm -hmm. she needed to do is clear her mind and read with attention and that she could retain what she read if she read with attention. So she showed the very minimalistic notes that she would take, very minimal notes. And she demonstrated how she would do it. And um, and that method has proven successful for some students who have that same issue, that they get pulled away by doing their notes and then forget what they were reading. Yeah. And, and that's just a great example of how, you know, everyone, their perfect approach is slightly different. Yeah. And I think that's another thing that I've seen in tutoring is like, you know, you have the general suggestions and then it tailors for each person to allow them to best display their knowledge. Yes. Yes. There are some students that can, you can work with in tutoring in a way that it really does take one-on-one. Yeah. Um, so then came La Vanya's office hour and that's this most recent one. It was on January 18th. 2023, this was a live Barmax workshop. Again, some of this, this one's paid content. There are some that are on the YouTube page. Um, There's a performance test webinar more general that I did in May of 2020. It's on the YouTube page. Um, I can show you the YouTube page too. Um, But the one on the top left here, January 18th, 2023, we have an instructor named Lavanya and she has a method that was a game changer for so many people. Because she, her outlining is much more detailed than mine to the point that she had like written half of it by the time she's done reading. Yeah. So it's not a 45 minutes. I've always recommended like 45 minutes to read an outline, 45 minutes to write. She is writing as she goes, but what she ends up with is what she calls this Frankenstein document. And then she takes the last, you know, it's more than half an hour, but it's not the 45 minutes. To turn to go from Frankenstein to what she says, Bride of Frankenstein. Oh, when you like it. Turn it in, it's not beautiful, it's good enough. What you're turning in is good enough. And she does it with um, a, an MPT from, I think it's February 2011. It's called Butler v. Hill. And when we recommend this webinar, we tell you, right, you can watch this the first minute. Go read Butler v. Hill, read the file, read the uh, library before you watch the webinar and then you can do it with her. You can walk through it with her. So give it a quick read and then watch that office hour and she's incredibly helpful. So yes, we have those office hours, but then practice, practice, practice. For you California students, I would say start working with, you know, 2018, 2019, 2020, 21, 22, 20. That gives us, you know, 10 different tasks that you can practice with. You probably don't need to practice 10. So draw from those. Um, You can also use NPTs for practice. Like if you want to work on a particular skill and and one of us has told you, yes, that this NPT will teach that skill. But now that we have, I think, 11 California ones, those are going to show you what's tested in California. In California, you're in the fictional state of Columbia. You're almost always asked to write either a brief or a memo. Um, Well, no, there's a couple other things, but they're more straightforward. Whereas over in Franklin, on the UBE, we're in the fictional state of Franklin on the UBE. um, They sometimes have wacky things. And so I do, um, you know, we can recommend which ones those are that you should just look those over before the test to get your brain in that sort of plastic mode where it's flexible and can can absorb a new task. We haven't, the one funky thing that's happened in California so far is that they asked for the whole brief one time. Oh. Now they had given you a, a format, but you right. had to write the whole brief. You had to write the facts section. That's wild, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so you had to do like what you were asking for and the fact that you should not expand, but yeah, I and got, got not they, just argument. They, they've only asked for the argument. argument. So you have to watch the wording because it didn't say dropped the argument section of a brief. It said dropped a brief and not blindsided us because we had, didn't know that one was coming. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're, you see it's being recorded. 
So the recording will be, that's a, a great segue to, um, so I answered that one live and I'm about to answer um, this one live. So uh, on the Test Max YouTube page, test, is it Test Max Prep or Test Max? I think it's Test Max. So go to YouTube and do a search for Test Max and then go to the Bar Max playlist. Okay. And all of our free content is there, the Bar Max playlist. And this uh, will post there soon as well. I also saw a question earlier that we haven't gotten to yet. We have a foreign trained lawyer here. Yes. Welcome. We have a webinar on that YouTube page addressing uh, uh, preparing for the bar as a foreign trained lawyer. Uh, we also have, um, you know, a lot of our tutors have worked with foreign trained lawyers because lots of foreign trained lawyers use BarMax. I have worked with some. I had a student that I worked with all the way through her bar study. She was from Australia, a common law country and passed. But we also have Matias Gonzalez. He is bilingual English Spanish. So for people from civil law countries, but particularly in Latin America, he knows and he's not a, a lawyer from any of those countries, but he knows enough of the civil law legal concepts that he can kind of tell you what is translating over legal wise. So if you want to work with a tutor who's expert in that area, that would be Matias. Um, and we have video content. But in general, uh, what I would recommend is you've got to simplify your writing. Um, Iraq is new for you and the writing is so formulaic, it's elementary. And you've got to take out all the flourishes. You got to take out everything nice about your writing. Um, and you're probably very proud of your writing in English, in English because if you are at the point that you are, you know, feeling ready to step to the plate and write a bar exam in English, then your, your English is probably better than like most Americans. Uh, you can't show it off. You just have to write the uh, the very straightforward Iraq. So practice, practice those essays early. That really applies to the foreign lawyers. Um, in terms of content, it's good to get kind of a grasp on some history to get a little bit of the constitutional stuff, because like, why is it like it is? You know, short answer, slavery. Um, always. Always, always. always. It's always the answer. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, yeah. No. And and because, anyway, it's kind of that whole battle between should the states have more power, should the federal government have more power? And originally it was states because we were trying to get rid of a king. And then it was, well, you know, we don't want the states to be able to do certain things anymore. So we're going to. So there was a little bit of shift there, and that's where we got certain amendments to the Constitution and whatnot. And when you understand kind of what's going on historically, it starts to make a little more sense what we're doing. Um, the other thing, so that's a little foreign, uh, I would say. And then obviously our civil procedure and evidence codes are like nowhere else in the world. Um, evidence has to kind of like pass a bunch of tests to get admitted in court. Otherwise, the jury doesn't hear it, you know, and the jury is the fact finder, um, sometimes a judge, uh, but usually the jury. So you want to learn our evidence and civil procedure will be hard no matter what country you're from. If you are not uh, originally, you know, if your place of being barred was civil or common law, there's stuff about our system that will seem weird. And if you are from a common law country, contracts property towards these will sound familiar. There will be differences, but we all have our roots from the same tree. Mm -hmm. so, um, that is my advice for foreign lawyers. And yeah, just, just hire Matias. Just, just buy some bundle <laughs> and get Matias. He's great. He will help you out. Yeah, he will help you out. What else was I going to do? Was there something else I needed to cover? I got a bunch going on here in chat. Um, Thank you. I think you got the big ones. Let's see. Um, so Julia asked about, okay, I bought Barbary and I'd like to buy this. Um, I think Katie's Georgia got foreign trade. Okay, Julia. So specifically, do not, um, don't think about this as a supplement to Barbary. <laughs> think about Barbary as a supplement to this. <laughs> because Barbary gave you all these books, right? And you don't need them all. You need the Convisor mini review. You need the Georgia distinctions. 
Okay. If you've got the Convisor mini review, I know all their books. I took two of their courses. I still have some of those books around for giggles, right? Um, I took two of their courses. And then the third time I was smart enough, I just bought them on eBay because I didn't need the lectures. You know, I just got the course on eBay. Oh, Julia, you haven't gotten the books yet. When you get the books, mm, they could be upcycled to find furniture. No, um, they're yeah, I was originally. Just, yeah, I was. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. On the yeah, I mean, go for it, Emily. I was just gonna say I was registered um, when I was intending to take the bar exam before health complications. Um, my law school like essentially paid for us to do bar. I mean, we paid for it, but it was like we prepaid it right for us to do Barbary. And I got all the books, and um, I started studying it, and I was. I was frankly pretty lost. I mean, I'm just going to be totally honest with you. Yeah, like, so it was, it was very Julia, they're going to tell you that you need to watch, you know, eight hours of yeah. lecture a day and you need to, and then, uh, uh, okay. And especially, do you have a job, a life, children, any responsibilities? Okay. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do lots and lots of past practice problems in bar max. Use our outlines for the MBE. They are more streamlined than even the mini review. Okay. So for the MBE questions, use our outlines, use their mini review as your outline and do open book essays from the Georgia Bar website. You do not have time for 80% of their nonsense. Mm -hmm. So true. I mean, I'm, Oh, your kids are all are all grown. You have all the time to study. Well, then you can decide which lecturer you like better in each subject. But I have to say, we have a few real winners. We have several Harvard lecturers who are who are wonderful and very engaging. Um, well, it is still a matter of how much you can hold in your head at once. That's what was disorienting for me. Like in law school, mm -hmm. I was all about condense it down because then you can bring as much in as you possibly can, like in your brain into the exam. And that was my problem is I felt, I felt totally overwhelmed. Like, like it's, it's not just like exposure to more material does not convert into having more available to you when you sit down to take the bar exam. It's still a question of what can you fit into your head? And if what you can fit into your head gets you more points, you're in a better spot. So that's, that was, that would be my perspective on that from someone who tried to do one and then did the other. <laughs> Yeah, actually, that's a good point, though, because there are certain things that are heavily tested and doing a lot and focusing mostly on past questions will help you focus on those things that are actually tested. Like yes. even today, somebody was asking me a question. It's in our outline, uh, you know, between about the differences between pendant and ancillary jurisdiction. And you and I both know that it doesn't matter. It's like mm -hmm. there's a federal statute now, right. supplemental jurisdiction, just know the rules for supplemental jurisdiction, know how they apply. Uh, pendant and and ancillary jurisdiction are sort of historical shadows that are left in the law. Mm -hmm. Since they don't matter for answering any question on the bar exam correctly, I, as the content director, need to go take them out of the outline. Because nobody should spend okay. any brain matter, power yeah. on that. Nobody should be spending time on that. I'm admitting right now there's a flaw in our program. Go buy everybody else. No, don't buy everybody else. There's a flaw in our program and I'm going to fix it. Uh, because I, I realized that today that like, yeah. I've seen this come up before. Why do we have these words in here? They're just causing people to waste time. Okay. Bar right. is all about, we're giving you more, or I mean, not bar bar great. Bar <laughs> bar the other guys, you know, we're giving you more. So we're more valuable. Oh, what they're giving you isn't enough, you know, and they're like trying yeah. to you and yeah. it's like no just learn what's actually tested and pass the bar that way yeah you can't carry those 16 books into the exam with you either way you walk in there with nothing and so the question is what have you got in your head and you can only keep so much so how many points can what's in your head get you it's a numbers game that's it yeah 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 and there's things that we know will be tested. Look, baby, negligence is going to be eight out of your 25, yep. um, you know, um, courts questions. I am not a betting woman, but I'm betting on eight negligence <laughs> questions, you know, if not nine. So here's a question from Elizabeth Kelly that I'm going to uh, share with you, Emily. And well, I guess, have you? No, actually, I'm going to okay. tell this person about the extended study plan. Never mind. Because she says, how long a study schedule would you recommend if I am able to spend three hours during the day and most of the weekends? 
How many weeks prior to the exam do you recommend beginning to study? I have written a plan. It is, it's taken a long time because it's a little, it's a lot more detailed than our current calendar. Our current calendar kind of trusts you to figure out what you need to do and what works best for you and tells you what subjects to focus on each day, reminds you to do certain essays and certain problems so that you right. get through them. But this calendar is much more detailed, has many, many more essays, and it's 16 weeks, which means it would start April 2nd. The trouble is it hasn't been released yet because we are still refining it. I think UBE is pretty much done and California is in the editing stages. Um, so we have complete drafts of both, but they're in the editing stages right now to make sure that they flow, right? So right. that 16 week calendar. So we are hoping to publish it by the time it starts on April 2nd. So we're aiming for the end of the month. Uh, I'll get it to our formatting guy who makes things prettier than I do. <laughs> and uh, he'll make it look like it was written by somebody at Bar Max rather than, you know, like a mad <laughs> woman in her home office. Well, um, and my, and my like personal experience was sort of a two phase approach. Cause I started about, I did, it took about five months in total, but then the last two months were concentrated focus study where we had sort of like made a family decision to prioritize that above everything else. And then the other was sort of like, I had my three hours for there was secure childcare and there was nothing else, but that I couldn't do it at night. I couldn't do it on the weekends. I couldn't. So mine was sort of two phased. It was, it was five months, but then two were focused. Three were unfocused. And that was my personal experience. That that that's yeah. super helpful because yeah. even for people that do a more or more you know stretched out period of time studying, they may take off two weeks of work before the bar exam, right. and they can do a whole lot of just flipping through and reviewing essays and issue spotting and checking, issue spotting and checking, like lots, you know, in a very like full way that two weeks before, and then spend the week before just memorizing, memorizing, right. Um, yeah. So if your study schedule is going to be a consistently three hours a day and then some weekends, what I put in my extended calendar is eight blocks a week for 16 weeks. So, um, the, uh, you know, I've sent a draft to some people who requested it. And so I said, look, if you have a little more time, you do seven blocks a week, or, you know, if eventually this could be adapted to a six month calendar. So then six months, people would only need to do four and a half, five blocks a week, you know? Right. But they do need a period of more intensive study closer to the exam, whether that's, I can take off work completely for two weeks or my family and I are going to get together and rearrange some priorities for two months. Was, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and it wasn't that you were completely off. It wasn't like, you no, 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 no. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> I was, it was just that the difference was night and weekend, right? Like, because before during the non-intensive, I had three hours. And then during the more intensive, I had intensive plus nights and weekends. And so that was sort of the, the shift between right. intensive. Right, right, right. So it sounds like uh, the student who asked this question or the particular one I read is in the middle, right? So she it does. Could, yeah, in between. She could, do a, she could do a slow and steady wins the race eight blocks a week. You know, if she's, if you're doing great, then do nine blocks a week at the beginning. And then you have a little more wiggle room at the end, you know, when there's a lot more MBE questions crammed in, um, so, you know, things like that. It's always fine to do an extra essay or an extra 10 MBE questions oh, while yeah. working on a subject. But the way I've set up the calendar, it involves space repetition. This is why it took a little tinkering, which is a concept of like when you encounter a subject for the first time, you want to encounter it again the next day. Mm -hmm. Then again, two weeks later, and then again, a month after that, right? In order to keep it fresh in your mind. So I tried to phase this calendar. So basically like starts towards first and you're going through your second time through torts before you're even done mm -hmm. with all the MBE subjects. Um, yeah. But it's because it's the right timing for spaced repetition in the 16 week calendar. So ask us for it and we will send it to you. Okay, student. And um, yeah, so I would recommend you start at the beginning of April at it on the schedule that you have. And I think you're going to be okay. And if you find it's too much, then do less. But if you find it's not quite enough, it looks like you have enough wiggle room in your schedule to do a little more. Um, you know, if the blocks are taking you more than three hours, because I tried to make the blocks three hours, but you know, everybody's brain is different. And I, I asked, I had some beta testers use it. And one of them said, look, 
it's been a while for me. The blocks were longer than three hours, but I, I went through them. He said, I used that calendar, like my Bible, <laughs> you know, right. I just crossed and off all the boxes as I went. Have I shown that to you yet? No, no, but that was I me. Off that. Everything. You'll, you'll like it. You'll like it. I've got it. But, I got to show you the calendar. Yeah. Yeah. But my experience was that it varied so much subject to subject. And that's why I put in the bit about assessing your subjects first, because for me, and this may not be true for everyone, but for me there, if I was in subjects where I was comfortable, I was going through way faster. Like I could do like three hours the whole, but then when I was in the subject that I didn't know where I was at, all of a sudden now it's taking me way longer. And that's why I say the subject assessment, individual subject by subject first, because mm -hmm. I was able to sort of look at this and go, okay, yes, this is taking me maybe longer than it should, but I know I'm good over here and that's probably going to go faster. And so that was sort of how I kept a check on, am I actually doing enough? Because I was comparing the calendar to my positioning in each right. of the individual subjects. That's great. Cause you know that certain things will take longer than's written there and some certain exactly. things. Less. Exactly. Yeah. And then sort so, of the adjustment. Yeah. So that's good because thinking of it in the block calendar, I wrote the, the assignments are divided in these blocks, study blocks. And right. so you'll say, um, okay, well, you know, I know that, you know, property law is a weakness of mine. So where, where I see blocks in property, I'm going to try to build in extra property blocks that week, because I know mm -hmm. some of these assignments are going to take me longer than three hours to do. Right. So when I write my week, I'm going to build in extra property blocks that week. And mm -hmm. if you're, you know, if you're saying, look, I'm taking a new state, but you know, um, you know, I currently practice in, uh, in corporations <laughs> and, uh, that's my strength. Oh, okay. you know, <laughs> I wrote corporations law questions for my state's bar exam. You know, <laughs> right. We're going to cross out half of the corporations blocks and, you know, exactly. put some exactly. more property in there instead. <laughs> And yeah, and I feel like when you are trying to like balance that time, that's the key is take what you're trying to do and look at where you stand in each individual subject. Because really it is, each one is its own distinct packet of information, right? Like these are, it's not just, the bar exam, right? So that was huge for me to stay on track. Right. Yeah. Keep at the same time, I mean, they're, they are related. Like when you realize that oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. transactions is basically a mortgage, but for stuff. Oh, yes. like, oh yes. okay. Yes. <laughs> no, yeah. This, the skills crossover, but I, I do think that like when, what we're comparing it to, I think unconsciously or consciously now, maybe not for the people who've taken a bar exam before, but people who are coming into it in law school is their prior experience. You know, you, you, each one of these is its own law school exam. And I guess that's what I'm trying to say, right? Like when you encountered these subjects before, they were each their own law school exam, if you encountered them at all. And now we have them all and they're here together. So yeah. Right, to have to face them all the same day. Yes. Exactly. Okay, exactly. so I have substantive questions, process questions. I'm going to take more questions. If the essay called the question and asked about possible contract defenses, um, do you have to start with offer acceptance and consideration, or do you go right to the issue only? The answer is you talk about the issues that are at play in the question. Um, and contracts is a great example for that because um, it's um, the one where it's hardest to spot the issue. Because they'll say, you know, can Baker recover from butcher? <laughs> you know? Right? And, yeah. and you, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, like, I don't know, can he? Um, like, what are you asking me? You know, <laughs> this is a parallel evidence question. And, oh, it was an oral contract. It turns out it's a statute of frauds question. The entire thing is statute of frauds. The UBE likes to do that. The entire thing is statute of frauds. You will not get a single point for writing about offer acceptance and consideration. You are just wasting time. But there's like 18 little permutations of statute of frauds issues in that question. Shopping carts. It was the question about the bleeping shopping carts. Anyway, California would be my caveat. In California, they do throw in a lot more issues and sub-issues per question. So there may be something, It's we have an office hour entitled Prioritizing Issues on California Essays. It was taught by Jennifer. She is um, a very experienced and wonderful California bar exam instructor. And you need to identify what your major issues are and you know you're spending time there, but there may be minor issues that you'll 
you'll just quickly hit as you go along. But in terms of your analysis, like you go where the facts go, right? So if the facts yeah. of the problem lead you to see that there's this issue there. So on California essays, more issues to contend with. On MEE, so UBE essays, cut to the chase. Yeah. Yeah, that's that was a really good question. Well, uh, a lot of times in contract, they'll say like a valid contract if they don't want you to talk about it or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah. If they say there was a, you know, Butcher and Baker yeah. entered into a valid contract to blah, blah, blah. Right. Then don't, not even a word. Yeah. Not a breath. Don't, not a thought. Yeah, then, then just don't even. <laughs> it was valid. <laughs> yeah. No, this is good. This is good. Um, So. Oh, yeah. So scheduling tutoring. So Katie, thank you so much, Katie. You are handling so much today. Are there any yeah. questions in chat that should come to me? You can turn on your mic if you want to, but if you've got background noise and can't do that. Hey, Katie. <laughs> Hi. Thank you both. Um, the only two questions that you might want to address to the whole group is kind of just how to get started with Barmax. Um, and then also some people were asking about the difference between um, if you just purchase the regular course or if you select a lifetime option. Okay. So if you purchase the full price course, what's the price of that, Katie? Uh, oh, the, I mean, the lifetime option is like what, $24.95? The course, if you go in to check it out, if you, well, if you go into the page, I'll drop it right here in the chat for everyone. Wait, I had it. <laughs> I had it in here. So the course is $18.95. That's the, that is limited access to two bar study cycles. So let's say you buy it now. The bar exam's in July and February. So it's basically good for a year, right? So after it's it's good for two bar study cycles. So through the July bar exam, you can study. And if you either don't take it in July or for whatever reason, don't pass in July and you end up taking the bar in February, then boom, you've got it still through the February cycle. You don't have to come back to us and say, oh, please turn my bar max yeah. back on. You know, no, you've got it for the February cycle. So you'll have it for two bar exam cycles. Now, if you do not pass in February and you want to upgrade to lifetime access, you can do that for the difference in price. Um, so the, li the lifetime access price, I don't know what it is. Um, let me see. Oh, she put a link. Yay, linky link. It's Wait, an it has information. So, ah, I'm sorry, except for I can't get to it because my chat boxes got bigger. Okay, so um, oh. if you're if so if you're looking for the lifetime access, and actually the lifetime access, if that's something that you're interested in, you could start that today as well. Like if you're like, oh, I definitely want to give myself, you know, two years to study for this or whatever works best for you. Um, right. What you're going to do is you go in and you look at the courses and you hit select the course and it will add that to your cart. And then when you go to the cart, um, there's a button on the right hand side that says add lifetime access. Um, and you can automatically do that upgrade for an extra six hundred dollars if that's so, something. OK, so that's the difference is six hundred dollars. So basically, we do not ask you to pay six hundred dollars to take the course a second time. But if you're going to take it a third, fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh time, we ask you to pay that six hundred dollars once. So then it's lifetime. That's your life. You don't get to share it with your grandchildren, but for you. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> for you. We are with you until you pass the bar, basically. We're with you until you pass the bar. Uh, but yeah, if it's more than two cycles, then you will pay the $600 more. That's how we we ended up dropping our price from, it was $24.95 for a while. We dropped it to $18.95. Um, and so really, you know, you can look at it that way. The price is cheaper than it would have been otherwise. And we were able to do that by, okay, the people, the users who are going to stay with us the longest, you know, have to kind of shoulder that um, little extra piece. Um, was there, did, was there another question, Katie? You said two things and I got, I don't know if I answered both. Um, tutoring and what that process looks like. Tutoring. Okay. Yeah. So you buy tutoring. And you can talk to someone if, um, you know, if you have specific concerns and we think you should be assigned to a, a specific tutor 
then you can talk to one of our um, advisors and we can make that happen before you buy the tutoring or, or after you buy the tutoring. And then we can make sure you get assigned because otherwise you will be assigned in a round robin fashion, which is, um, so like if you need the, well, if you need the Florida or Georgia tutor, she's the only person that's going to come up in your round robin because you show up as a Georgia person. But if you are a foreign student who needs a UBE tutor, we're all going to show up because we're all UBE tutors. And it's basically, you're going to pick the time that works best for you. And you might randomly pick a time and you're saying, oh, I want Emily, I want Emily, but you don't know her schedule. So you get assigned to, you know, somebody you never heard of, who's also great, but not Emily. So, okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. So, um, so that can be awkward, right? Um, but if, if it's like, I want this time, then just pick it and you'll get assigned a tutor. And if for some reason, you know, your tutor, you know, isn't a good fit for you, you let us know and we'll reassign you. But otherwise, usually people stay with the first tutor they go with, you know, all of our tutors really are awesome. And we just make sure that our students are happy. And you keep trucking with that tutor. So the first time it'll be, uh, it'll be either assigned by a salesperson or sort of hey, randomly assigned based on schedule, what exam you're taking. And then once you've met with that person, that is your default tutor, unless uh, you request a change or, you know, something comes up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which has happened. Yeah. But usually people stay with their tutor. And um, yeah, and then you decide how many hours you want to buy when you purchase and you and your schedule come, your, you and your tutor come up with a schedule together. So there might be people who meet with their tutor once a week through their whole bar study period. You know, that would be, you know, 16 or 20. Uh, and well, what do we have? 18 weeks now until the July bar. Um, so they might purchase 20 sessions and then spread them out um, and then maybe for the peak study time in June, July, have two sessions a week. Um, other right. people like to meet twice a week. Other people like to just check in every other week to make sure they're on track or to ask questions along the way. It's really, um, it, it depends on what the student needs. Absolutely. You know, I have students who want to be super efficient with their time. I had one woman who would send me a list of MBE questions. Great. before the session and I would have it in a Gmail and we would open it up and we'd go boom, 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 boom and go to the questions she had questions about because she, she was using me for the MBE and, you know, and she's like, That's okay, needed. here's the contracts questions I want to go over and here's the two property questions I want to go over. Boom, boom, boom. We got through a lot. She was smart. Yeah. She um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not shocked by that actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very, very driven person. And other people, I mean, and I had another guy who was like, uh, no, no, I just need you to help me with scheduling. It was like a hundred percent scheduling. And I mean, I did go over essays for him at first. He was a brilliant foreign lawyer and no, no, I just want to make sure I'm like doing everything right. So I'd meet and I'd be like, dude, you're doing everything right. You know? (laughs) So sometimes it's more scheduling and sometimes it's like, I'm completely lost or I want to burst into tears right now. You know, like this is all normal. And, you know, we meet you where you're at and we help with what you need at that time, whether it's substantive, whether it's scheduling, coaching, you know. Yeah. I think the most hands-off I had um, was somebody who just wanted writing help. Like they, Mm -hmm. they just wanted basically to, and they'd already submitted on the portal and they basically just wanted to know like, how do I actually do what they're telling me to do? Like, in other words, they submitted a couple of essays and they kept getting the same feedback. So they got frustrated. And so they went to tutoring because they were like, obviously I'm not getting it right because they kept getting the same feedback from multiple graders. Um, And then the most like intensive student I've had, we actually met like three times a week leading up to the bar exam. And she Mm -hmm. was doing like, she was working and then she was doing intensive. She worked four days a week. And so we like met um, on Thursday, which was like at the end of her workday. And so we set her up for the weekend. Then we met on Saturday and did something. And then on Sunday, we set her up for the next week. So we had like two scheduling and then one where we would do an intensive dive into something. And we, so we did three days a week like that. And those were sort of my two polar. Did she just take the the February bar? Yes. All right. I want to hear. What state I know, are right? What, what, what I, state are we rooting for? I know you can't use her name, but yeah, Pennsylvania. So we're rooting for, yeah. Okay. Our rock star, Barmax rock star in Pennsylvania. 
Yeah, right. we got we got. Some you sound amazing. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so you work with this tutor in the way it works for you. I do have to say though, when you pay for one hour of tutoring, you get one hour of the tutor's time. You you pay us one hour, we pay them for one hour, one hour of tutoring time. So if you want your tutor to review essays, you can send it right before the session, and you guys can use the session time to review it together. Yeah. Um, sometimes I've even like I'll have the Google Doc open with yes. the student's essay and, you know, we'll both be looking at it together, you know, instead of having it on just one screen or the other, we'll have a shared document that we're working on. So those techniques are good, but they will not, your tutor will not specifically grade your essay and give you feedback in the off hours. That's what the grading portal is for. But it can be super useful to bring the grading portal to the tutoring because then you almost get two perspectives on it. Because if somebody else graded it and then you're getting your tutor feedback to like interpret it and apply it, I think mm -hmm. that can be super helpful in, in for helping people understand how to operationalize the feedback that they've been given. Yeah, it's why I tell the graders, like we like multiple graders to it, each student should encounter multiple graders because the way that one tutor explains things might not be the same the way that another tutor explains things. Right. You know? Like I do inline feedback and sometimes I'll give examples of how things can be written instead. And that, you know, that helps certain students and, you know, other, other graders put, you know, like detailed comments off to the sides and it's just yeah. very different styles of grading. And I kind of accept them all as long as I think they'll be helpful for my students. Yeah, everybody's students. different. It's Barmax's students. I don't own any of you. I don't own Barmax. <laughs> I just feel very invested here. Um, <laughs> I've been working here since 2019. I was a law professor. I was a lawyer. I was what else? <laughs> a clerk. I've done. I've done a bunch of things, and um, and this is just the best job I've ever had by far. I obviously love what I do, and I know Emily has. Um, That's great. <laughs> a day job as well, but she comes in and hangs out with us for fun. I do. I like it. <laughs> Yeah, so we have a big list of instructors online and in our bios. Um, Katie just posted the link to that. Um, no, yeah, Delaware's its own ball of wax. Um, yeah, let's see. There's more that's come up in Q and A, and I answered whether this will be available. Yes, it will be on the YouTube page. I thought I got rid of it. I mean, um, dun, dun. do I recommend supplementing with Adaptive Bar, MicroMaster, Bar, MaxEssays.com? Okay, Adaptive Bar uses real past bar exam essays, uh, or, I mean, questions, MBE questions, which is good. They're the exact same questions we have in Bar Max. So I don't really recommend it. I recommend doing what Emily did, using the Barmax questions, doing them open book. I love that your experience is fairly recent and you can talk about oh, it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And doing them open book, referring to the message board if you have questions. Um, right. So yes. don't, Step on the outline. Step to yeah, the message board. I would board. <laughs> not do them in Adaptive Bar. Adaptive Bar has written a few fake questions in there. I don't know if they've improved them since. Uh, there are not that many civil procedure questions available on the real released questions, uh, which is a weakness because NCBE hasn't released that many. So Adaptive Bar decided to make up for that by writing some questions. And again, they may have improved them since then, but there was a tutoring student who brought Adaptive Bar questions to me and I said, I cannot work with these questions. And now I know civil procedure, okay? I know civil procedure for the bar, but more importantly, I clerked in federal courts and did all this civil procedure for my job. So like I learned it, okay, before I came here. I couldn't do the questions, not because I don't know civil procedure, but because the questions were so unbar exam-like and, and frankly bad. Like some of them, the, the answer choices were a paragraph long. Okay, so if you see those in Adaptive Bar, just run from them, don't do them. But most questions in Adaptive Bar are real bar exam questions, just like bar, bar Max. All questions in Bar Max are real bar exam questions. I don't know the other, oh, I didn't talk about what essays you get in Bar Max. Well, if you buy Bar Max, you get every single past bar exam essay <laughs> and performance test. 
all of them. We, we have a welcome packet that we send you with all of them. Now, we encourage you to stick to the last 10 or 15 years because it gets a little bit, you know, like less relevant beyond that. But if you want to turn in a question from 2008, send in that essay. We can do it. Um, we don't just say send in particular essays on particular days. You can send in whatever essay you want, whenever you want, within reason. We, we can't take like the distant past, like, you know. Keep them to the last 10, 12 years and we're okay. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, but we, but they're there. So there's no real reason to use a different source for bar exam essays. We have the license to them to share them with our students. So we share them all. And a lot of you do sort of some level of independent study. So when you want to zip through a bunch of secure transactions essays, then you do that. And you you know, pick one to turn in for writing, you can do that. And it doesn't have to be, okay, on this week, everybody turn in this one secure transaction. Right, yeah, no. Because then they they do that because then it's much easier for their graders and they can pay their graders less <laughs> <laughs> and make it very efficient. It's very efficient. Our way is a little bit less efficient, but a lot more effective. I, I would also just suggest, you know, from someone who who just, like you said, recently did this program and, and set for the bar exam, there is enough here. And like you've been saying, it is targeted, it is effective. And what, what I would say is, you know, resist the security blanket or the siren call of thinking that more is better. Yeah. Learning this targeted material is far better than having tons of scattered material sitting on the table in front of you. More is not better knowing it more deeply to and, and, and more securely to where you walk into that room and you know it's coming with you is better. This is, um, I had a slide and I removed it, but obviously I should have kept it. <laughs> That's what it said. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I left out the keyword. Everything. Yes. <laughs> we really and, did. And, and we truly, really did. I didn't finish all of the available essays and I didn't finish all the multiple choice, even though I tried to do as many as I possibly could in that time frame. Right. There was still more material left for me had I wanted to continue studying for another two months. Yeah, we, we want people to push through and finish all the multiple choice that they can. There's no way you're going to yes. do all the essays and there's no and, need to. But we And I was it. close on the multiple choice, but I didn't make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, you, you, I guess. It was what it was. Okay. It was, it was um, real life. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I've been talking to some people about supplementing and those were my specifically my Georgia and Florida and uh, Wisconsin people who have um, Wisconsin just has a little bit more and Georgia and Florida have different essays. Fortunately, they're available for free on their state bar exam websites. So I don't think anybody needs to buy an expensive bar review course, or if they bought bar max, buy another bar review course or materials, especially for the UVE or California. I just, I don't see it as necessary. And for the reason that you gave Emily of like trying to put too much in your head, it can be actually harmful. If it comforts anyone, I had all my Barbary books sitting there um, and I didn't open them. I stuck with the Barmax materials because there was enough. Well, so there you go. That's my perspective. Online, online. You're going to do a bonfire. Are you coming up with some sort of like art piece? I do something. On Etsy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting in my corner. There's so many books. <laughs> so many books. Anyway. So many books. Um, yeah. A lot of the people that you see, if you go on our website for testimonials, like what they describe as their study process was pretty simple and it might sound suspicious, but they're writing it because it worked for them. Mm -hmm. You know, I give a lot of advice like, hey, do all this practice, do this, do that. Not everybody follows, follows the advice. We have streamlined lectures. We have a lot of problems. And if you are working from real bar exam problems and you know how your brain learns material, then do that. Because Absolutely. In Barmax, we have everything you need. Anyway, we want you to buy Barmax, but this webinar, including our techniques and including our, you know, advice about bar prep study and the information that you got about, you know, different states and whatnot. Um, look, we offer that for free. We offer lots of useful stuff for free. So go to the YouTube page, 
test max YouTube. Um, If you are not in a position to buy bar max at this point, we have plenty of other free content out there for you. Like I said, we don't give it all away for free, but lots (laughs) of it's for free on there. The bar max playlist is long and it may have some things that are of interest to you. And um, we went way, 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 way over time. I can't believe there's still 30 of you here. Thank you for sticking (laughs) around. Thank you. Y'all are awesome. Thank you, Katie. (laughs) Yeah, thanks, Celeste and Katie. It's past my bedtime, but I really, really appreciate all of everyone's participation today. And I thank you. Have a great night. Bye-bye.